Welcome to this episode of Erasing Shame, where we are encouraging Christian Asian mental health. My name is DJ Chuang. I'm joined with my son, Jeremiah. And DJ stands for Dad of Jeremiah, thanks to my son's creative acronym, Decoding. And this episode will be a father and son conversation about depression and suicide. Now, we were both Chinese American. I was born in Taiwan and came to the US. I was eight years old. My dad is from Fujian. So, technically, uh, my lineage is Fujianese. Uh, for those that appreciate the lineage of um, Chinese history. And by the way, my extended family in Fujian actually did a family tree. I don't know if you remember this, Jeremiah. We have two hardbound volumes of our family tree that goes back 21 generations. And we have chuangs that go all the way back to the province of uh, Fu, Fujiao. Um, and they, my name is in there. It's amazing. I'm the oldest of three boys. And uh, over the years, I'm now 56 years old. Over the years, I've had quite a bit of life experience, and we're going to touch on parts of that, starting with a content and trigger warning. We're going to be talking about depression and suicidal ideation, because these are very important topics. They're a matter of life and death, and they touched myself and my son Jeremiah in very personal ways. So in terms of depression, I have uh, often felt sadness throughout my life. I think I first noticed it in middle school and high school, and then it's persisted all the way through my 20s and even into my 30s, 40s, and 50s. So when it came to my feelings and my emotions, growing up in a traditional Chinese home, my default emotion was just sadness. And Jeremiah, you've seen some of my childhood pictures yeah. from high school where I just have a sad face. I just didn't feel happy, and therefore I had the conviction that I wanted to be honest with my feelings, and I didn't want to pretend having a happy face when I felt sad. Mm -hmm. Even though I had good grades, I graduated seventh in my class of high school with 149, which is a small high school, but just to say that school, I was doing well. And because I was doing well in school, there wasn't the urgency or the concern that my family had to get me counseling or get me help. Plus, we had the stigma and shame of not seeing a counselor because we're Chinese, we're Asian, we don't. Mm -hmm. Councils are for crazy people. Yes. And we're obviously not crazy. We, we were not crazy in the sense of uh, unable to manage the things of life. And um, so that, that was most of my life into my 20s and e even into my 30s. I went to college at Virginia Tech I graduated with computer engineering degree. I worked a couple years, then I went to seminary in Dallas, worked for another five years. So one thing I say is I spent 10 years of my life trying to be a pastor and realized I could only be an okay pastor. And who needs an okay pastor? We really need, um, or I think pastors would do better when they are passionate and enthusiastic and uh, can do the pastoring well uh, rather than just okay but anyways that's that's a small sidetrack my son was born in 1997 when i was 31 years old and then i was diagnosed bipolar at the age of 35 when i had a difficult transition from leaving being a pastor to going back and being a software developer and engineer. And over the past 20 years, I've worked in the nonprofit world and now doing some podcasting as a 
passion project and as an outflow of my life as I've learned to better manage my mental health. And in 2017, I had another episode that was very dramatic and difficult to recover from regarding my mental health. So I want to bring my son Jeremiah into the conversation. So in the past 25 years of your life and living with someone who has had a or who has a mental health diagnosis, how has that affected you and what have you observed? Yes, so the uh, like you said, uh, when I was four years old, when you were 35, uh, that's when you were formally diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, but that was happening before that, uh, before the formal diagnosis. And uh, what I remember in my childhood growing up was um, being spending a lot of time reading books or watching TV, um, doing sorts of activities you can do alone. Um, mm -hmm. I'm an only child, so I didn't have any siblings uh, nearby, any peers to just uh, play with or um, make faces with or just be a kid with. Um, most of my peers were friends from school or from church, um, which meant they weren't uh, close by. They weren't just in the neighborhood or they weren't just in the room uh, right next to my room. Uh, so I remember being a quiet and unassuming kid. Um, I had a lot of curiosity and wanting wanted to learn more about the world. Um, mm -hmm. Learning about science and uh, the English language in school, learning about uh, some of my Chinese heritage, learning about American culture and sports and all these things. But uh, something I did not learn very much about was emotions and emotional health. Um, so that was absent from uh, my years growing up because of cultural reason cultural reasons as well as just uh ignorance so since my uh, my dad was just beginning his journey of of discovering his mental illness trying to find language to describe that trying to find ways to cope that are healthy and so he was lacking in the emotional vocabulary the self-awareness um and since my parents didn't really have that, then they didn't pass it on to me. Now, did it affect you? Did you notice that I had emotional outbursts of anger or being withdrawn or being disengaged? What could you interpret now in hindsight besides not being able to put words to it? The, I can't remember anything specific okay. from you. So we got along pretty good? Yes. Okay. The, most of what I remember with you growing up was uh, we did a lot of piggyback rides. So we have some pictures. I enjoyed doing piggyback rides. And okay. we would uh, go swimming as a family in the water. And uh, we would have family dinner every night. Oh, and we still do most and, of the time. Uh, we still do that very often, even as I'm an adult. And... Good. Mm -hmm. I want to give people a, a peek into what our family life was like, even though we didn't have the emotional vocabulary to process some of the more challenging feelings that just come up in life with the normal stresses and twists and turns. Now, I'm married to Jeremiah's mom, mm -hmm. who's very emotional as an artist. Mm -hmm. And the way those emotions got expressed was through bold colors in art. Not necessarily with words all the time. Yeah. How was that helpful and how was that different for you, Jeremiah? I think that 
with mom, it's easier to read her emotions based off of her body language and her facial expressions. So um, it was nice to be on a good side and to mm. see her being happy mm. and enthusiastic. Uh, but uh, with that, with that ease of expression, there was also uh, some fear I had if I was doing something wrong, mm. if she was angry about something or stressed out from her day's activities. Um, so that's what I primarily had in mind in terms of negative emotions if i reach back into my what i understand about my childhood i remember being hesitant about my mom finding out if i was doing something wrong or if mm. if there was something uh that she didn't like that i was watching on tv mm. um, then i would hear about that and it wouldn't just it wouldn't just uh, pass under the rug. Mm. We, we didn't have rugs in the home. Yes, we did. Oh, you're right. We had... We had hardwood chest. floors with rugs. Yes. Okay. And we didn't have carpet. Yes. One of the things um, from my childhood is we played a lot of board games as mm -hmm. a family. And um, I learned how to play chess. Mm -hmm. from you and one of our rugs was this big um i think it was 12 feet by 12 feet um it was a chess rug yes that's so right. there were um stuffed dolls for each chess piece and you could use the entire room as a chess board yes that's a good memory okay well we we could talk about our lives for a long time but on this episode of Erasing Shame, we want to focus on the two topics of depression and suicide, suicidal ideation. And so during those early years of my struggle in being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I, um, it took me about a year to recover, um, being diagnosed in 2000 and 2001. It was a long time struggle actively for me recovery was actively working with a therapist uh, for talk counseling and also with medication so um, if you would like to know what medications help me i'm happy to share that with you you can just message me at erasingshame.com um, but during that time i also not only had depression i also had uh, suicidal ideation so even though I had a loving family and I loved being with my son, um, my feelings of depression were just so overwhelming that I had moments where I didn't know how to live on. And suicide was something that crossed my mind as a way of uh, stopping the pain of that struggle. Now, my suicidal ideation didn't get to the point of severity where I was planning a way to do that. And we didn't have lethal means of uh, implementing that in the house. And then honestly, if I can be honest with you, Jeremiah, I was too afraid of the pain, the physical pain that would be involved in trying to die by suicide and so I never went to figure out well how would I actually do it and how do I do it in a way that would make sure that I would um, end my life and while I was caring and concerned for my wife and for my son you Jeremiah and my friends around me I, I just didn't have enough um, energy to know how to manage the weight of the negative uh, overwhelming feelings of despair and depression with um, how to go on and that's where I needed help and I'm glad I was able to get help and be humble enough to get help and I know that's a struggle for many people that uh, don't get this far in getting past suicidal ideation. 
Now, um, we'll, we'll fast forward. So that was back in 2000, 2001. We'll fast forward to 2017. And I'll briefly mention a personal crisis that I had in 2017, February 1st. Now, on that day, I had a hypomanic episode. So I have, I have bipolar disorder 2, type 2, which means I have high mood swings and low mood swings. And on the high mood swings, I have extra energy. I feel like I need less sleep and I have more creativity and the ideas in my head are just constantly flowing. So it's, it's a very good feeling, but it's also a very dangerous place to be if I just act out on those feelings without personal reflection and consideration. Well, on that day, I let myself go because I was frustrated with the difficulties I was facing in January. So I don't know how much of the details you remember, Jeremiah, but I'll review it with the people who are listening and watching. So in January, I had insomnia, laryngitis, and bronchitis. And out of that frustration, I said to myself, I'm going to let myself feel better and good the next time I have a high mood swing. Instead of doing the things that I've done for the past 17 years in learning to manage my mental health, I decided to unmanage it, not manage it when I had the next mood swing. Well, by the end of that day, I was apparently behaving strangely and I was put in handcuffs and detained with a mandatory 72 hours hold in a psych ward in Anaheim, California. Now the full story on that episode and my recovery is at my personal website, dhchuang.com slash my2017. And I'll add a link in the show notes at erasingshame.com for those of you that would like to hear that entire story. But Jeremiah was there midday and saw me before I was taken away in the police car. So I wanted to give you a moment, Jeremiah, to recall that episode. What do you remember? Yeah, so that day in 2017, I was at school and um, I was living in the dorms at that time. So I was not living with uh, my parents, with you. And... So I, I completed the day's activities, and um, at some time in the uh, while I was in between classes, uh, you messaged me uh, saying that you had purchased some tickets to see this band called U2. Mm. Uh, that's one of our favorite bands. We grew up with the music, and uh, we're glad that they're still together and um, playing and creating something something that's so wonderful to hear. And another thing that happened was um, the pacing of your messaging. You also wanted to spontaneously get together for dinner that night. Mm -hmm. And um, that seemed within the range of normalcy for me, since you're more of a spontaneous person and I'm more of a planner. So I arranged to uh, have a family dinner that night, and then I was able to invite some friends who were available as well. And uh, we met at the Anaheim Packing House, mm -hmm. and uh, things seemed to be going okay, pretty normal. The Anaheim Packing House is a high-energy place, since there's so many people, and the open space and the decorations are all very uh, modern design, very positive and um, stimulating and so I didn't notice anything wrong with you being um, in a manic a hypomanic episode um, as we have described it in hindsight but I got the call from my mom afterwards uh, that you had been detained that day um, and that's because it was after we separated 
from dinner, we finished eating, and then I was heading back to my car. Uh, that's when you started um, behaving strangely. Do you uh, recall my mom told what me, I was doing? Because I don't. Yes, my mom told me that uh, you went to a, a fine dining restaurant within the Anaheim Piking House. It's called the Blind Rabbit. And you tried to uh, get inside the restaurant without a reservation. So first you approached the hostess or the host and asked if you could get a table. You wanted to have a special date with my mom. And uh, they found out you did not have a reservation, so they declined you. And then you tried to enter in uh, by another means, probably through uh, one of the other doors. And uh, when they blocked you again, then you were resisting and um, not responding to their communication. And at some point, I think they called the police and, and had you get involved since you were being a difficult, um, hmm. a difficult consumer. Wow. Customer. A customer, a consumer, indeed. Yes. So um, I'm being a little bit careful with the wording here. We have a cousin who's a police officer in Fountain Valley, and he adjusted my wording that I wasn't arrested, but I was detained, even though I had handcuffs on. So that's why I used the word detained instead of arrested like I used to. But being in the inside of a psych ward was very sobering. Uh, never thought I would see the inside of one. Very humbling. And they put me on medication that felt like I was being sedated uh, and stabilized. And I think one of the things I'll mention here is in the medical model of psychology and psychiatry, their aim is to stabilize you. And because my body responded well to the medication, uh, I was stabilized within the three days and then they released me. Typically, people are not released until day four, five, even day seven. But when I was released, it also took me another three or four months to find the right mix of medication where I could feel somewhat normal again. And then it took nine months to um, be more fully normal in terms of functioning well being able to work again and being able to maintain my self-care. And then this podcast came along in 2018 of January, Erasing Shame, because I, um, by, by that time, I had the emotional and personal support um, to share my story more broadly and to provide a podcast in a space where we could have honest talk for healthy living. Now, during that recovery process in April, okay, this is where Jeremiah's story picks up because there was an episode in his life that was just as or even more traumatic than my episode in February. So Jeremiah, you have lived experience with suicide loss and that happened mm -hmm on April, just two months as I was on my way in my recovery process. Yes. Now, what I remember April, from that April day, 2017. Yes. And what I remember from that day, I got a text from Jeremiah's friend saying goodbye. And I was still, my mind was still disoriented because I was recovering. I had taken a break from work. And I didn't know how to respond, but describe what happened that day um, for you, Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so April 12th, 2017 um, was one of the worst days of my life because I woke up uh, to one of my friends from high school. His name was Parker, and um, he had been struggling with depression at school for uh, many months. And uh, the text I got from him that day was uh, him saying that 
oh, you're one of my best friends and uh, I've really appreciated uh, being friends with you and uh, your, your work ethic is very admirable and, um, and I've always um, been wished I could have that as well. Um, and, um, and he was saying that, um, after I'm gone, please make sure to, uh, spend time with my dad and play board games, uh, just like we used to, uh, we had a group of friends in high school where we would get together a lot to play board games. And, um, so my friend was texting me this suicide note his last words mm -hmm. and um, he was still thinking about uh, his family how his family could go on in the future and continue having uh, good memories even though he did not understand that um, dying by suicide leaves a huge hole in uh, the hearts of those who continue living without without the person that they lost mm -hmm. So the, um, yeah, so when I read this, I was in disbelief because I, I didn't know that my friend's depression was this severe. Um, I, I honestly didn't know that much about mental illness and how depression was related to suicidal ideation. And I figured depression was something that was treatable, something that you can overcome when you have the right support. Um, but I didn't, I had never thought about what happens if someone ha is having mental illness, having severe depression or severe anxiety or both. What happens if that does not receive help or support? Mm. Then, then unfortunately, unfortunately, some people can resort to uh, suicide and that is uh, with me being a survivor of suicide loss I'm someone who has uh, lost somebody from suicide he was one of my best friends in high school mm -hmm. and um, that has been a very painful experience and it has really changed the uh, course of my life in terms of, oh, okay, this was a turning point in my life because I'm having experiencing this tragedy, the loss of a friend. Uh, two months after, my dad has gone to the psych ward uh, for his mental illness. Mm -hmm. And this has changed me um, because... I now have much more compassion for those with mental illness and the tragedy in their stories. Um, and this compassion also motivates me to find hope for them, to find support for them, to advocate for policies and research and uh, community activities and beliefs that will bring people to have endurance and resilience in their own difficulties, um, to have resilience to continue loving those in need. And I'm glad to, the silver lining in all this is that I've been learning so much about emotional health and mental health and self-care and um, how to be a safe person to other people. And uh, those have been this has been a journey that has um, has made my life much more human, and um, and um, much more human and um, enriched. Thank you, Jeremiah, for being open and honest to share that really difficult time with all of us. Um, I remember Parker well. He often came over to our house, and he was a fun-loving person. He was in marching band with you. He 
seemed to have a good social life. He had a lot of uh, energy and aspiration for college life. And he, he was a good kid. Mm -hmm. my, my funny memory, if I can share this, this one time I brought back a pizza from Domino's and I handed it to him and the handoff didn't go very well and it, it fell on the floor in our <laughs> foyer and it was face down and the it was Hawaiian pizza so the pineapple and the ham just went splat on the floor and we lost the pizza. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're both a little embarrassed about that episode, but that was my most poignant memory of Parker and the pineapple pizza splat. <laughs> Do you have a fun memory of Parker that indelibly left an impression? I'm sure you have many, but you want to share one? Yes, yeah, so what I'm thinking about uh, right now is... Um, he and his dad had a very impressive collection of board games. They were mostly strategy games, such as Risk and Access and Allies. Um, but there was this one year where he came over for 4th of July, and we, dis we discovered this game he, got, he had called uh, Pirates. And what it had was um, you take little... It's like those 3D puzzles where you... You have cut out pieces of um, plastic or cardboard, and then you assemble them into uh, little 3D ships. Hmm. And so you have that and then have a big old um, map with islands and ocean, and you would move around the ships and attack each other, trying to <laughs> become the ruler of the seven seas. And um, that was significant uh, because it was a great way to celebrate uh, the 4th of July and the time off um, during the summer. And it was also important because in high school, I would have a lot of movie marathons. We would host a lot of, mm -hmm. of um, get-togethers where uh, we would project a projector onto our wall. Um, so the screen was nice and big, and we would play movies for hours and hours back-to-back. So when we were playing this Pirates game, I was also recently introduced to the Pirates of the Caribbean series. I had never seen them before, so <laughs> I figured, hey, I, I want to watch all of them in one day. And uh, we, that's what we did. That's what we did. And so it was great to share that and discover that with my friend Parker. And um, I hold that memory uh, close to my heart because uh, he is, he's no longer around to make new memories. Hmm. Yeah. So we treasure the good memories and we learn things to help others to value life and to face the struggles of depression and suicidal ideation. Uh, that was just over five years ago. And so, um, Jeremiah, you've been very active in helping with suicide prevention. So tell us about your involvement uh, volunteering with the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. What have you learned? What have you done as a volunteer? And what words of advice would you share in terms of suicide prevention and warning signs and helping those who may struggle or those who know someone who is struggling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, so my journey with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention uh, started with my involvement with Saddleback Church, actually. Hmm. And uh, the lead pastor there, uh, Pastor Rick Warren and his wife Kay Warren, they had a son who struggled with mental illness his whole life. He had a dual diagnosis. And sadly, their story is uh, marked with uh, suicide loss. Their son died by suicide um, a few a uh, few years around um, around when we were going through our struggles. It was a couple years before or after two thousand seventeen, and. Um, 
something that inspired me with the way they responded and recovered was that they were honest and vulnerable about their grief and and they would share their uh their precious and cherished memories about their son and they would share about how they were feeling about facing the future without him and so i realized that if i uh, join a community a group of people that are willing to talk and to listen to difficult conversations about suicide and suicide loss, then that can be a wonderful source of recovery and of healing and of giving back to the community. And so that's how I started looking at uh, what programs and volunteer opportunities the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention offers. They have a local chapter here in Orange County. And uh, so I first started getting involved by um, seeing what sorts of events they volunteer at. So what, what they usually do is um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention focuses on three things. Hmm. They focus on awareness of suicide, um, its preventions and causes, and... They focus on advocacy, so in terms of policy making, mm -hmm. talking to lawmakers, Congress people. Mm -hmm. um, how can we have our medical system be more effective in mm -hmm. supporting those uh, who mm -hmm. have suicidal plans, and uh, how do we prevent it long term as a society? And then they also focus on uh, support and healing. So they have support groups and um, a few other resources that are crucial for helping those who have survived the loss of a suicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so which part of that have you enjoyed volunteering the most? The, yeah, one of the um, things that impacts me is that even though the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has a top rating on Charity Watch, a top rating on Charity Navigator, mm -hmm. meaning they're responsible with their finances, they're mm -hmm. transparent about how they do things. Um, and they've uh, had some groundbreaking research in their efforts over the years. Um, that's all big picture stuff. That's good, good for me to hear about, but what inspires me is the local things. Mm. I've learned that um, in Orange County, as there are annual events and festivals um, that happen on a regular basis, the our local chapter here continues to reach out and to have a, a booth uh, alongside all the other booths um, at the event. And what we've noticed is that uh, when we first started out, when the chapter was founded a few years ago, talking about suicide and being present at these events to try and promote awareness mm -hmm. of suicide, its statistics, and um, the tragedy and the danger of it. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of stigma where the crowds of people would um, avert their eyes mm -hmm. and try to avoid our booth, and, oh. um, and they would just be, there would be this resistance to learning more about it, and... Uh, resistance to finding out what resources are available. Mm -hmm. um, but in recent years, uh, especially in the pandemic years, uh, we've seen that people um, are very uh, receptive, very um, affirming and um, positive to see that we're, hey, we're here, we're part of the community. We want to let people know that they can have support if uh, they've survived a suicide loss, there are that we're actively working on preventing suicide and promoting mental health. And um, so seeing that change in people's attitudes and seeing the community rally together has been the primary source of inspiration uh, for me as a volunteer. Well, 
Thank you, Jeremiah. And as we've endured the past two and a half years of pandemic, the mental health crisis uh, on top of anti-Asian hate crimes, and then the instability with our financial situation, climate uh, change and uh, things like that, and then uh, suicide rate continues to climb. And so this is a very serious issue. And so when we talk about uh, suicide, uh, a person who may feel isolated, isolated and alone and in pain, when that person dies by suicide, it affects on average at least 113 people, according to the research. And I'll add a link in the show notes so you can uh, look into that. And then out of those 113, at least 20 are impacted dramatically. And so um, even though you, um, if you're someone who's struggling with suicidal ideation, your life does matter and it does affect a lot of people. And then uh, one of the fascinating researches about uh, suicide is uh, there's something to be learned from those who have attempted suicide but have survived because they were in the frame of mind where they were trying to die, but they did not. And because they've survived, they've perhaps learned some things. They're able to share some things about what went through their mind so that we can add some preventive measure and add some support so that people that are in that state of mind and in that situation do not choose the route of death, but they would choose the route of life. And so we'll be having a future episode here on Erasing Shame with someone who survived their attempt at suicide and how they are able to not only survive but thrive in life. So that's in an upcoming episode that uh, you'll want to stay tuned and watch. But as we talk about preventing suicide, what are some warning signs and things that we as friends of someone or related to someone who may be struggling what can we watch for and what can we do? Jeremiah, do you have a list mm -hmm. you can share with us? Sure thing. Yeah, so what I wanted to do now is to share with you what the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's research has shown about uh, what are the factors that affect the risk for suicide and what can be done for prevention. And uh, so I'll be reading this list here, but also commenting uh, some of the ways that I've experienced it. Um, so, as you might have heard before, mental illness is something that is affected by a holistic range of factors. It's affected by someone's, uh, yeah, psychology, someone's psychology and emotional uh, well-being or lack of well-being. Um, it's affected by someone's environment. If they're in a um, positive or a negative environment, it's affected by someone's relationships as well, and also their spiritual beliefs. Hmm. And so um, some of the risk factors with uh, health could be um, yeah, having a formal mental illness. So you have bipolar disorder. That mm -hmm. would be an example of something. Someone could also have uh, schizophrenia mm -hmm. or uh, a conduct disorder or a personality disorder. Um, but uh, it does not the risk for suicide is not limited to having a formal diagnosis. You could also be having a season of anxiety or depression, going through something um, that is emotionally very challenging, such as a breakup mm -hmm. in a relationship or the loss of, um, loss of a family member. And uh, so that can be a condition that affects someone's mental illness. Some other factors could be serious uh, physical health conditions like chronic pain um, or a traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. So uh, please be aware of that. If someone's going through physical pain, you, you could also consider um, how that is affecting their mental state. And um, in terms of environment, it's important to know if someone has access to firearms or mm -hmm. a lethal amount of drugs 
Um, so that's what you were mentioning before. We didn't have that in our house. We've never owned a gun and um, we've never had a lethal amount of drugs available in the house. And some other environmental factors could be prolonged stress, such as unemployment or bullying or relationship problems. And um, there could also be exposure to suicide. That's an environmental risk factor for suicide. So if someone um, has died by suicide recently, then that could suggest to another struggling person that, oh, suicide is, that's something within the range of options of dealing with difficulty. Hmm. It's not okay, but that's how it gets introduced hmm. to people's minds sometimes. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, this can especially happen in the media. Um, if there's a TV show or a movie or if a celebrity dies by suicide, hmm. then that's part of the environment and the risk factors. Uh, now let's move on to, uh, there's also some historical factors. So if someone, someone's family has um, struggled with suicide before, like an attempted suicide or a um, completed suicide, then that will affect how someone perceives it, how someone approaches, how someone approaches if it's acceptable or even um, plausible, something to do. And um, there's also, it's also important to know if someone has had childhood abuse or trauma. Mm. That's a historical factor that could affect their um, suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So those are the risk factors that the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has researched. But we don't want to end there. We want to talk about the protective factors. What kinds of things can you be watching out for and looking for in your own life if you're struggling? And so um, let's start with the uh, mental, psychological area first. Um, It goes without saying that professional mental health care is very helpful if you feel like you need it or if you notice that someone else might need it. There are a range of options at um, different price points. You can find an affordable therapist uh, um, and you can get the help you need. And um, this is one way of expressing uh, proactivity of mental health, right? When you, when you take action to see a professional to talk about what you're experiencing, um, that is making a choice about your mental illness, making a choice to, to improve your mental health. Um, and you can also do this in other ways. You can reach out for support and um, have a community and a family and friends who will listen to you and be safe people for you, people who will care for you, Maybe they'll make you a meal or give you a hug. Um, it's their, it's their um, privilege. It's their honor to provide that for you, to learn um, what ways are enriching and uh, fulfilling for you to be supported emotionally. And um, another protective factor is to have problem solving and coping skills. So when you approach a problem, how are you going to respond to it? If you can come up with a good plan, if you can think about, oh, okay, I need to find out how to do this in order to, um, in order to get the help I need, then um, having problem-solving skills and healthy coping skills is a way to do that. And um, in terms of the environmental factors, it's important to limit access to firearms, and other lethal means. Uh, We mentioned lethal drugs before. So when you limit access there, when you limit access in the environment to those means, then that is uh, preventing uh, suicide. 
And um, another area that I mentioned before was uh, spiritual beliefs can be are related to um, suicide and mental illness. So if someone is part of a cultural or uh, a cultural religion that encourages help seeking, that improves someone's sense of purpose and self-esteem and discourages suicidal behavior, then that will go a long way towards preventing suicide. Now, let me interject here because it's been a tradition in some Christian circles that suicide is a sin and suicide is wrong and people shouldn't be uh, taking the life into their own, own hands because only God is in charge of life. And some of that is true, but a lot of that is not helpful. So for someone who is struggling, what they need is not condemnation because there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. But what people need is compassion and care and support. So when you find someone or if you yourself are someone who is struggling with suicidal ideation, recognize that God sees you valuable. You're created in the image of God. And while the emotions and the mental ideas and the oppressive thoughts are overwhelming, there is help and there is hope. Please reach out if you can. And if you're not able to reach out, those of you who recognize someone who may be behaving in a, a warning sign kind of way, mm -hmm. reach out to them and provide the support and care and compassion that they are needing. Mm -hmm. All of us can do something. Yeah. You want to touch on some warning signs? Yeah, so that's great for us to start discussing the warning signs. The, uh, the key word when you're thinking about warning signs for suicidal ideation and behavior is a change in behavior. So um, it comes down to uh, what do people say and uh, what do they do. So if someone's struggling, you're going to see changes in uh, one or both of these areas. So people who are struggling with suicide ideation will say things uh, such as wanting to kill themselves, wanting to feel uh, they can't find a way out, they feel trapped, they could talk about feeling hopeless or uh, not having a future. And um, if they're being honest, um, they'll be talking about how much pain they're in and um, be sure to listen when you notice someone going through that. Um, sometimes people with mental illness will say they feel like they're a burden to other people. And um, that's a very difficult feeling to go through. And um, something that I experience when I have depression sometimes. Um, and uh, let's also talk about behavior. What are the warning signs of how people behave when they have suicidal ideation, when they're reaching the extra difficult point in their struggles? Um, so it can look like increased use of alcohol or drugs. Mm. It can look like um, searching online for uh, how to form a plan for suicide. It can look like withdrawing from the activities that they normally enjoy. They could isolate from friends and family. Um, they could also uh, start saying goodbye to friends and family mm. and acquaintances. And uh, related to these goodbyes is they could start giving away their prized possessions. So that's a big warning sign if you see, if you see someone doing that. If they anticipate that they're not going to be around, then they might try to give away those possessions. And um, something that might be counterintuitive with behavior is someone could get more aggressive or more fatigued. Mm -hmm. um, this is related to the mood swings that are 
that are part of struggling with mental illness. Um, so that could also be a behavioral risk factor, a warning sign for suicidal ideation. And um, related to other moods and emotions that are warning signs, uh, there's depression, there's anxiety, and loss of interest. We've mentioned those. Uh, there's also things like irritability and feeling ashamed. And um, someone could also mention feeling relief or a sudden improvement. And that might because be because they have a mental illness, they're not completely in touch with uh, a realistic perspective mm -hmm. of their situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your time in sharing your life and your, some of your struggles and your honesty and how mental health affects all of us, either around us or in us or both. And we want to create a safe place through this podcast and through virtual social media and even meeting up in person. We live here in Orange County, California, but because of my freelance consulting work, sometimes I travel around the country, would be happy to connect with you in person and learn together how to live life well mm -hmm. and to support uh, to support each one of us together as a community to encourage Christian Asian mental health. Uh, it really does take not just a village, but a community, it takes the body of Christ, uh, really being the safe place to show compassion and care for those of us who do struggle and all of us do struggle from time to time and some of us struggle all the time mm -hmm. and it takes those who struggle and those who know someone who struggle to, to take those bold faithful step towards health and the resources God gives us in him in his word in his spirit and in the brothers and sisters around us to live well and worthy of the calling God's given us so these are these are hopeful words i hope you are feeling encouraged that um, suicide is not the last word god has conquered death uh, in eternity and in the now but we have to receive with open hands and open hearts for the help that he desires to give us so thank you for watching and listening to this episode of Erasing Shame. Check the show notes at erasingshame.com. Subscribe and like and share on Facebook, on YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please rate and leave a review so that others can be a part of this community as we continue this conversation into the weeks and months ahead about encouraging Christian Asian mental health. We want to start with these conversations and then we want these conversations to start communities of care and compassion in local churches and in homes where we can really fill a huge gap in stopping stigma, erasing shame, providing support to complement the professional help that doctors and therapists can provide. and then. In, in doing all of that, we provide that continuum of care. I think that will change mm -hmm. the lives of many for this and future generations. So thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. I need a better sign-off.